Hi, thank you. Thank you everybody for joining today. My name is Gabriela Rizzo and this summer I had the privilege of working with Dr. Antunes on this project about understanding the role of halophilic archaea for materials production, which is under a larger project of understanding halophilic archaea in space biotechnology. So why study extremely halophilic archaea? What's so important about them? There's two reasons. The first reason is the importance of water for life as we know it. We know that a unifying requirement for life is liquid water. However, on Earth, we form we can um, form brines, which form when salt dissolves in water, creating pockets of incredibly saline water that does not mix with the seawater around it, which you can see in that photo to the left. Brines can also be found in desert soils where water evaporates and leaves behind uh, concentrated salt solutions. Brine oceans and deposits are relevant for us to study because they've been theorized to exist on moons such as Europa and Enceladus and even Mars. If they do, they could potentially harbor microbial life. So who are the champions of life in these brines on Earth? Halophilic archaea. The second reason is because halophilic archaea have polyextremophilic characteristics. So in addition um, to being able to survive in extreme conditions like high salinity, they can survive in conditions such as desiccation, high radiation, extreme cold and high temperatures, oxygen deprivation, vacuum, and low nutrient availability. All right, I've talked about archaea enough, and I'm sure you're now wondering what archaea are. Well, this is a phylogenetic tree of life, and this shows us that all of life as we know it on Earth can be divided into three separate domains. The first domain is bacteria. Bacteria can exist on skin, like Staphylococcus aureus. It can even be used in the food industry, like Lactobacillus bulgaricus. Next, we have Eukarya. And Eukarya has kingdoms that we should be easily be able to identify, like Plantae and Animalia. And lastly, Archaea. Archaea can survive in some extreme environments, such as volcanic hot springs, brine pools, like I mentioned earlier, and even in the guts of ruminant animals. So now that we're all caught up with life and we're familiar with archaea, I can direct your attention to extreme halophiles, which is what this project concerns. So extremely halophilic uh, archaea belong to the group archaea and can survive in highly saline environments. So halo means salt and philic means to love. So they're salt loving archaea. And this will be relevant later, but uh, halophilic archaea can be split into three separate orders, which are Naturalbes, Halobacterialis, and Halopharicales. They are of particular interest due to their ability to thrive in these extreme environments that are analogous to conditions that might be found on other planets or moons, as I mentioned earlier. This is a really cool photo I wanted to show you guys. This is Lonar Lake in the Maharashtra's Buldhana district, which turned pink due to a high concentration of halophiles producing carotenoids. Those carotenoids will be important later as well, but just to show you or visualize that salinity. So my project had three parts to it. The first part of the project was to gather papers on the general applications of halophilic uh, archaea. This first draft um, was a collaboration between two of my teammates and we created a table. In this table, we listed all of the applications that we can find regarding halophilic archaea, all of the industries, industries that we could find along with their references so we can keep track. Some of these applications included fermented foods, plastic alternatives, and bioremediation. Then we started to notice a trend and we were able to narrow our focus onto papers dealing with specific subsets of halophilic archaea applications. This time we were taking note of the species that were used. So the trend we saw was health and nutrition, materials production, and recycling, treatment, and energy. As I mentioned earlier, I focused on materials production for the sole reason as I thought it was pretty interesting. So there are many biomolecules of interest that these halophilic archaea can naturally produce, which can be directly used to make different types of materials. For example, bacteria rhodopsin. Bacteria rhodopsin is a light-driven proton pump that resides in the membrane of halophilic archaea that can be used um, for wearable bioelectronic devices such as biosensors. Carotenoids, as I talked about earlier, and I'm sure you've guessed by now, are a pigment produced by halophilic archaea. 
and can be used in food, medical, pharmaceutical uh, industries as dyes or functional ingredients. In this case, carotenoids were used in food packaging to ensure that products would have a longer shelf life. And lastly, we have polyhydroxyalkanoates, PHAs for short, because it's a mouthful and I will keep tripping over the word. So PHAs are naturally occurring biodegradable polymers that have similar properties to petrochemical derived plastics. So therefore, they're just a really great biodegradable plastic alternative. So I used resources such as PubMed, Google Scholar, and MDPI to find relevant papers. And then another great resource I used was Research Rabbit. Research Rabbit functions similar to Spotify, if you're familiar, where you can have a playlist. So in this case, I had a folder and I would add papers to that folder. Like I would add songs to my playlist. And based off what I added, I would be connected with papers dealing with similar topics and also authors that play like a big part in the field that had a lot of papers um, regarding the topic. So that just helped streamline the literature review. Lastly, the most important part is LPSN. So I used LPSN to find the exact order of each halophilic species I would come across. Because if you mentioned, um, if you recall, I mentioned earlier that there are three separate orders. LPSN also helped me to make sure that the nomenclature of each species I referred to was correct, because there's always a lot of updates with nomenclature. For example, I could be referring to two separate species, but in reality, they were one species and just had a nomenclature change. So it helped me keep track of the species I was referring to. So these are the biomolecules of interest based off of the literature review. So we have the bacteria adopsin, which I mentioned earlier, um, can be used as wearable biotechnology, but it can also be used in the energy industry as dye sensitized solar cells. We have PHAs, which can be used as biodegradable plastic, but can also be used at, for biofuels and in the medical industry for um, bone repair. Carotenoid production, which can be used as the dyes and food packaging, can also be used for feedstock, uh, feeding for livestock and fish, can also be used as a precursor for vitamin A. S layer proteins can be used in nanobiotechnology. Cellulase can be used for biofuel. Starch can be used for uh, production of bioethanol. Amipolyonase can be used as an anti-staling agent in bread and a detergent additive. Chitin can be used as for in nanotechnology and also for bone repair in the medical industry. And lipase production can be used for biodiesel production. So I'm sure you can gather from this table that there are a lot of different industry applications with all of these biomolecules. Okay, this is the fun part. This is the part of the project I love. Now I can introduce you to all of the species that use these specialized biomolecules to produce materials. So there is going to be two tables I show you, and they are just split because it's easier to view. So right now you're looking at the halobacteriales. It's important to highlight that there are many other species that can produce these biomolecules, but the species that I'm presenting to you in this table and the next table were found in literature within the context of materials production. So starting with the halobacteriales, right off the bat, we can see that there are four species that have multiple biomolecules of interest. So they each use uh, multiple biomolecules to produce multiple different types of materials. Similarly, when we look at the halopharicales and the natrovales, we can see that there is one species that has multiple biomolecules of interest. And of course, it's important to highlight all of these species and how their biomolecules can be made into different materials. But it's also important to denote the species that are able to create materials using multiple specialized biomolecules because they can have many different bioproducts and industry applications as opposed to the other species. This leads me to part three of my project. I now needed to cross-check cross the strains and species that I found during my literature review to see if they've been previously tested on in the astrobiology context. So I introduce you to this, this paper, um, this table from the Wu and All paper. This paper compiles data um, presenting an overview of halophilic archaea tested for astrobiology relevant features. This table is split up in the same way that I just presented to you before, where you're now looking at the halobacteriales. 
And then right here is the natrobalas and the halopharicales. Within this table, within both tables, certain species have had much more testing done than others, and there are no species that have complete data sets. So this table and overall this paper supports the fact that halophilic archaea are understudied despite being one of the best terrestrial organisms to observe for potential of life in our solar system. And these are the results after cross-checking the species I found with the species in the Wu and All uh, table. So the species that are highlighted in yellow have not been previously tested, uh, tested under astrobiology conditions. The ones in purple have been previously tested. So as you can see from the, from the first table, I'll go back just to give you the visual. There is an overrepresentation of halobacterialis, but you can argue that it's because it is the largest order out of the halobacteria class. We also notice that PHAs, carotenoids, and starches are very important because a large number of species use these biomolecules to produce materials rather than um, other biomolecules such as amypolyonase or um, chitin. It's also interesting to note that the species previously tested for astro, um, done under astrobiological testing are the ones that have multiple biomolecules that can be used to create different materials yet previous studies have not focused on the species in this context. So we know that halophilic archaea are understudied from an astrobiological perspective. The bioactivity, bioproducts, and applications of halophilic archaea in space are virtually unexplored. And halophilic archaea support in situ resource, resource utilization. So they're very important for us to study and to get a full picture on. We're still curious about how the bioactivity and bioproducts of the halophilic archaea will change when exposed to different space-like conditions. So for future studies, it would be ideal to ground truth the results from these species collected uh, by testing them in a lab setting. So these species and strains should be targeted for future study. First is our previously studied organisms and the ones that produce multiple biomolecules. They fall under the same category. Then, we, I talked about our biomolecules of interest, which are PHAs, carotenoids, and um, starches. So these are our PHA producers, our carotenoid producers, and our starch producers. That is all. Thank you guys so much. I want to thank Dr. Antunes for taking me on this summer and for letting me work on this project. And I also want to thank my teammates, Sayani and Emma, for their collaboration on part one. And I want to thank everybody at Blue Marble for giving me this opportunity. And here are my references from the tables that I showed you earlier. Questions? Awesome, great job, Gabby. We Thank have a little you. bit of time for some questions. If anyone has some, I see Sanjoy has his hand up immediately. Good job, <laughs> Sanjoy, okay. go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Gab, for this presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I had never heard of Research Rabbit, and so I'm excited to learn more about it. Um, but my question has to do with the pH a's, um, I find single-use plastic of a plague of civilization. How come there we don't see more of these PHA-derived products? Is this new or too expensive or what's the limitation? So to my knowledge, it's not an expensive process to go through. And that was a question I also had because I feel like it's relatively accessible. So I don't know why it's not more common, um, but that's the most that I can answer on that. But I, I think I think it's I think it's awesome. And I think it should be integrated more. We should be using PHAs more. And like I mentioned earlier, the species that I mentioned aren't the only species that produce PHA. Like there are a ton more. It's just out of the scope of what I've looked at. So it should be more accessible. Thank you for the question. Awesome. Any other questions for Gabby? Oop, I see a hand up from Sib Sonker. Go ahead. Yes, uh, am I audible? You are. Uh, I have one question. Like, how do you think this uh, in situ resource utilization is in terms of the space biotechnological applications, as you mentioned, can add to the space sustainability of, you can say, future uh, habitats that humans can set up on other planets? Yeah, I mean, if so, if we like if we take these organisms and we can make all, this, all of these different materials, then maybe we can put these organisms out when we're in space on another planet 
and have them produce those materials there and have it be more sustainable. Or if we're traveling to another planet, let's say, um, we don't need to care, like PHAs are a really great example, right? Plastics, we don't need to carry that with us going somewhere. We can bring the organisms instead and then they can produce plastics out in space. That was a great question, thank you. Thank you. And then Priya, I think I'd like to see what your question's gonna be. So I think you'll get, you'll get the last question here. Uh, well, I just, uh, I found this rather fascinating, but I do take slight exception, and this is no reflection on the young lady who gave the talk, but um, there has been a ton of research done on Haloarchaea. Uh, in fact, because it was one of the first organisms ever sequenced on this planet, there is there are, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of articles and also on the industrial applications. I'd be happy to share references. The Chinese have done a great job on the PHA, PHB uh, work before that, the Spanish, there's lots of references on that. Um, they are being used for production of plastics in various places and various applications. It's not always out there publicly as like, okay, this has come from Halo Archaea, but there is a ton of work that's been done. And the reason why NRC1 is um, so highly represented for the experiments is because that is the model organism for Halo Archaea. So that just sort of, um, just to clarify that, that's, that's why. Um, and the reason why we as scientists choose model organisms like Drosophila, the, the fruit fly that we were talking about earlier, or E. coli, um, is because if we all pool our resources and work on one organism initially um, to better understand it, then we can work as a community and move the field forward. If everybody does a separate organism, it's very hard to correlate. And it's very important to look broadly. But if you if you can focus, it's like the moon landing uh, that that we as Americans did in 1969 and, and we as Indians did this year. It's a joint effort. If we do it towards one goal, then it's fine. We can do a lot of things beyond that. But that it, that used to be the, the strategy. And E. coli is a wonderful example of E. coli K-12 community is extremely collaborative. Um, they, they, they have websites together. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about any other communities, but, and the Drosophila community also, and also the nematode community, they have great, uh, common resources. So I'd be happy to discuss this with you further because, uh, our laboratory is the one that did the sequencing of the original genome. So happy to talk to you about that. Yeah. Thank but you great so talk. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. And I would love to talk more about it because I think it's all really interesting and I would love to learn more. So thank you. Sure. Thank you.